Uh, my name's John Phoenix. I'm a Chief API Architect at HSBC Commercial Bank. And um, I don't know if you're familiar with HSBC. It's a big um, international bank. Um, it's got lots of people, lots of colleagues around the world, lots of customers. Uh, it's one of the things I really like about working now. I've been there about four years now. And we've got a lot of IT professionals as well. We've got a lot of smart people. And we really want them to deliver value at speed, but with safety as well. And uh, so this talk is all about API governance. And I'm going to be giving you five tips that I've learned while I've been at HSBC and at other banks as well. Um, and you know, what? I think it's great that you've turned up for a talk on API governance, because often it's seen as a really negative thing. Um, and I think that's because it's seen as a bottleneck. It's something that slows down the pace of delivery. Um, and it's kind of like a necessary evil that you need to go through before you can release value, you know, production code. Um, but one thing I've been working on for the last uh, four years since I've been at HSBC is really about making API governance an accelerator instead of a break. So how can we do that? How can we balance giving people freedom to deliver APIs at the pace they need to, while also having the uh, safety that we need to operate as a bank and how to do that at scale? And we've got thousands of internal APIs already, and that's only growing. And we want this fantastic API experience. We want it for our external customers, and we want it for our internal developers as well. So how do you maximize reuse? How do you secure your APIs? How do you operate at scale? Uh, how do you do all of those things without slowing everything down? So I'm going to give you some advice, um, some tips, if you like, uh, about five um, approaches I've taken to help with API governance. I think some of this applies to other types of governance as well. I'm not only going to tell you about things that have worked, I'm going to tell you about my failures as well. So things where I thought this was a brilliant idea and it took me a year to realize that it just didn't work. So hopefully I'm going to leave you some practical tips at the end of this. But before I do that, I just wanted to give you a little illustration about why standards and governance are so important. And, and I'm taking this illustration uh, from Apple. And, and whether you, you might be an Android fan or an Apple fan, but I think it's fair to say that Apple have a really good reputation for having consistent apps on their app store. And how do they achieve that? Well, they have some really good design standards. I'm a, a registered Apple developer and they've got great style guides. They've got example code. Uh, so they've got all of these standards and, and patterns. And they've also got some really good tooling. So they've got Swift Playground and Xcode and all these other tools that help you uh, build APIs that meet their standards. But also they have a pretty strict validation process before you go live. And there's been big companies who haven't been allowed on the Apple platform because Apple hasn't approved their apps. They don't meet their style guides or standards. And we want exactly the same thing for our HSBC APIs. So we want, you know, we need standards to give to people, but that's not enough. You know, you can't just leave people with hundreds of pages of standards to read. You need guides, top 10 tips, lots of things, guided journeys that help you deliver your APIs according to the right standards. And also you need some accelerators as well, a bit like Xcode. Um, so for example, internally, uh, we've got a little tool that somebody created called API Boot that really accelerates the delivery of our APIs and makes it so that our APIs meet our standards right from the beginning. And then, of course, you have the kind of traditional governance process before you go live. So the kind of deployment, um, pipeline checks, design validation, scoring certification. And this is where most people think about governance. Think about design authorities and checklists and scoring. And that is important. But actually, uh, I think there's far more value that you get from your investment if you concentrate on the left hand side of the life cycle. And so some of the tips that I'll be talking about is how to invest more in the left hand uh, of, the, of the life cycle, because that's where you're going to get the biggest bang for your buck. That's where you're going to get the most value. OK, so five tips. So the first tip is trying to answer the question about what to govern. 
what should you govern in an API governance process? And I'd sum it up as as little as possible. Um, and maybe a politer way of saying it is govern the absolute minimum you need to help your people deliver value to your customers and to your internal developers while managing the risks that you have. And the risks that you have are going to be possibly different from the risks that I manage. And the value that you deliver may well be. So you need to design a governance process that is bespoke for your organization. Now, um, I, I've been an, a, a developer you know, most of my career, and, and I went through the whole Corba, RMI, SOAP. And then when I found REST um, over 10 years ago, maybe even 15 years ago, I kind of fell in love with the style of it you know, that whole RESTful style. And I became a zealot when it comes to API style. Um, I was absolutely passionate about having a really good style. And, and style is important, don't get me wrong. But I think I've learned to temper that zealousness around style. And actually, for me, the most important features uh, of my governance process is security, which is non-negotiable, and operations. So can I take more APIs onto my platform? Can I quickly identify them when I have a production problem? Can I scale? You know, do I have too many duplicate APIs? So reputation is important, don't get me wrong. But I'm focusing now more of the style on the external facing APIs and allowing more freedom internally. So number one tip for me, is focus your governance on real risks rather than the personal preferences. Don't do what I did, which is just get passionate about style and forget about your real risks that you need to manage. So the second tip is really what does a good governance process look like? And, you know, I think there's lots of documentation on what a good a governance process is. You know, it's got to be scalable, got to be consistent. You've got to be able to manage your risks in a consistent way. Um, it's got to be comprehensive. So it's got to cover a fair estate of, of your API estate uh, and a fair amount of your API standards. Um, and also it's got to be evidenced. You know, you've got to be able to give evidence. We have internal audits. Uh, I need to know who has reviewed this API using what criteria, when they did it, what the actions were, et cetera. But the thing I've learned is it's relatively easy to create a consistent, comprehensive, an evidence process that's completely unscalable. And by that, I mean that it can't cope with the amount of change in your organization, the number of APIs that you're delivering. And it can't, it can't be responsive enough as well. So if your APIs take uh, two weeks or three weeks to get a review, we just can't deal with that um, latency in your review. So for me, good governance uh, to judge good governance, it's got to be able to scale to meet your delivery cadence. So that's tip number two. Uh, and I know I'm just skimming over the surface with a lot of these tips. There's a lot more we could go into detail on. But um, it may be that you're starting off in your governance process, or maybe you have a governance process that isn't scaling. So the next tip is really around where should you invest your effort? And for me, the biggest win, as I said, uh, towards the beginning is in tooling. You know, it's far better to give tools to your developers that help them create standards compliant APIs from the start. Help your developers to fall into success rather than catch them at the border with strong governance at the end of the life cycle. The other thing is training. You just cannot do enough training you can't invest enough in training and, and a lot of you maybe you're thinking that maybe training isn't part of governance but i firmly believe it is making it really clear to people why you have your design principles why you have these particular patterns as opposed to those ones what risks are we really interested in managing and then visibility so by that i mean you know having a good internal developer portal or an external one or just a catalog of apis you know you can't complain that your developers are creating too many duplicate apis if, if they can't find them so invest in visibility and then lastly my favorite at the moment automation uh, this is something we've been uh, investing in the last just over a year year and a half 
And uh, again, this is all intended to make your, uh, it easier for your developers to do the right thing rather than the hard thing, the wrong thing. So tip number three for me, if you had to choose where to invest your effort, is shift left. It's so easy to think of a governance process uh, and to add additional process, add another checklist, add another meeting, add another process at the end of the life cycle. Far for better investment to shift left and help your developers be successful. That's tip number three. Tip number four is around your style of API governance. And there's lots of different styles that you can take when you govern. And again, this depends on your company, you know, the amount of change you're seeing and the geographical distribution of that change. So when I joined HSBC uh, four years ago, I set up two review boards. So one in India, one in China, uh, in Hong Kong, sorry. And I wanted them in the time zones where the majority of the APIs were being developed. And we had about six or eight people on each of these review boards. They were great people. Um, and uh, let's judge this style according to our criteria of scalable, consistent, comprehensive and evidence. Well, in terms of evidence, it was great. You know, they produced great evidence from the reviews and they were almost 100 percent consistent. You know, we I used to hop between the two boards. We used to get a few peer reviews going, but they were pretty consistent. In terms of comprehensiveness, kind of 50 50 and what I mean by comprehensiveness is um, in HSBC we've got about 130 pages of standards that's a lot for people to read and it's a lot for people to check as well and if you're reviewing six APIs in an hour that's 10 minutes per API and you can't really go through hundreds of standards in that amount of time so we used to have a checklist we got them to prioritize the um, the uh, review according to the highest priority. But, and I didn't realize this until about a year had gone by, it's not scalable, this approach. Well, that's not quite true. It was scalable um, when it was about the level of about 500 internal APIs. When it went, went above 500 APIs and the rate of change globally was, was increasing, this model just broke down. Uh, and it really broke down because it was a weekly meeting. Sometimes an API needed to come a couple of times. It could be two or three weeks before you got your API review. So it was breaking down. So I thought, OK, what's the problem here? Problem is weekly meetings and two review boards. Now, I can't have 100 review boards. Um, you know, we, we just cannot um, organize that. So what I did was take a completely federated approach. And so we set up a group called the API Champions, and we had about 140 of them all around the world, not just in these locations. And my idea was, OK, I'm going to train these champions and they're going to be the envoys, you know, the ambassadors in the local projects. And and they will enforce the governance and standards locally and they will escalate to me when people aren't following the governance or when we get a, a gap in the standards or a tricky problem. And you know what? Overnight scalability was fantastic. These people were embedded in the projects in the time zones and so they could review an API within an, within an hour of, of the ticket being raised. And it was about as comprehensive as the other ones were before. But what started to break down, not immediately, was as the number of API champions increased, was the consistency. And this was the killer in the end for this style for me. And maybe it would work if you had less champions, but I needed this number of champions to deal with the rate of change that we were coping with. And um, what we found was that um, that some people weren't reviewing the APIs adequately. They gave little evidence. They didn't fill out the checklist. And again, if you, you really need to trust but verify, and you really started to need an army of people centrally in order to verify all of this to provide the evidence, and that wasn't working. So we come to automated style, and this is my favorite. Um, here we were really investing on the left-hand side of the life cycle. So we were trying to say, let's give our developers the right tools that help them to develop APIs that meet our standards from the beginning, so they fall into success. Um, that was very scalable. 
it takes seconds for, to use these tools. Very consistent as well and great evidence. And the comprehensiveness of checking against the standards definitely increased. It's far easier for an automated tool to check the majority of standards, but we couldn't check all of the standards. And that's because not everything can be automated. Um, so things, uh, it's very easy to automate. Are we building APIs right? I.e., are we building APIs that meet your style standards? That's very easy to check, but it's much harder to automate. Are you building the right APIs? So it's easy to check are you building APIs right, but not so easy are you building the right APIs? And what I mean by that is, are you building a duplicate API? Are you building it at the right level of granularity? Is it, does it match your business domain model? You need people for those aspects. We've automated some of that, but really you need people. So my latest, latest approach and my latest style that I'm using now is a hybrid approach where we focused uh, automation on the vast majority of our APIs, but also we have a review board that focuses on, are we building the right APIs? And so my tip for you is, if you're spending all of your time just checking, are you building APIs right? Try a different style of governance because you need to be spending far more time on are you building the right APIs? And then lastly, my tip five is really around how to automate. So we took a, an open source API linter, we extended it, uh, we added a UI, we added a database for an audit record, we containerized it. Uh, we've made it an inner source project actually, so that uh, anybody from across HSBC can create their own little rule sets and then um, we can have, uh, you know, scaled development. So my last tip is really how much and what to automate. So I've said it already, building APIs right is perfect for automation. Um, it's a really, a, you know, gold mine for automation. But you can't automate everything because you still need people to do the qualitative judgments about are you building the right APIs. So not only uh, can you not automate everything, you shouldn't automate everything either because there's massive value still in peer reviews. Uh, whether for training or the most useful reviews I've ever had is to get my business involved in the reviews because they know the language that is easiest for our external customers to use. So get your business involved in your peer reviews. And then lastly, a surprise for me was automation is a great way to help with training. So I've had feedback where people have interactively got feedback that uh, their API doesn't meet a standard. They had no idea we had that standard, that that header had been deprecated. So having automated, train, uh, automated governance with uh, immediate feedback is fantastic for training. So last tip for me is automate as much as you can, but please don't forget you still need people. There's still value in people, and that's why you still need API architects like myself. So five tips, focus on real risks rather than personal preferences. Good governance, you can judge it because it scales to meet your delivery cadence. Invest your effort in shifting left. Make it easier for people to fall into success rather than check them at the border. And how to pick, how to make sure you've got the right style of API? Are you just checking style? Are you just checking that you built them right? Or are you, are you able to spend time checking that you're building the right APIs? And then uh, lastly, automate as much as possible, but it's very clear you still need people. Thank you very much. So um, Thank I don't know if we can we time for questions? Yeah, we do. We have a couple of minutes. We could definitely take some questions if we if we have them. Um, I guess you know one of the areas of conversation certainly was um, the the bottleneck on approvals and and you know having people in the middle of all of that. Um, is that something that you struggle with? Like the, you know, trying to deal with um, you know just especially deciding what to build. How how much of a bottleneck are you creating? I think you're on mute now, John. Oh, sorry. Yeah, maybe. Sorry. Um, 
So, yeah, absolutely. That's why uh, we had to move away from that central approach to a more federated and automated approach. Uh, people are great. They bring great. Oh. We lost you entirely now. <laughs> um, well, uh, for anybody that has additional questions for John, uh, I'm going to assume that he won't get connected again before we sort of run out of time. So please direct your questions to him on Twitter or LinkedIn or some other medium 